All right, ladies and gentlemen, I am here with Dynamo, and we are going to be talking about Command and Conquer. What's going on, dude? Hello there. I am doing fine. I'm ready to talk about the game. Yeah. Where shall we begin? I guess we can begin in the beginning, which is what this game sort of did, as it was really the first uh, first game resembling an RTS. Yeah. It's pretty much the first modern RTS game that has ever been released, alongside the first Warcraft game, which is even more primitive than this one. So, it's pretty much uh, the first of its kind. And uh, that is probably why I think cutting in some slack is uh, pretty much understandable. Yeah. Even from a perspective of the time, like, if I were a new player back in the 1994 or whatever, whenever this was first released, basically, as what we played is actually a real release for Windows. Originally, this was not a Windows game. It was made for DOS, which is an older platform. But uh, basically, I can understand maybe not even f fully stopping to analyze many of the game's flaws, as this was one of the very first games that allowed me to control different units in a military setting, construct bases. I mean, these were all new elements back then. So I can maybe imagine it's... Silly to imagine now that you will stop and marvel at such things, but back then I guess that's what people did. Yeah, that is why the reviews were so glowingly positive, as these people didn't really stop to analyze the level design or the gameplay as we are about to do now, but instead they simply were like, "Wow, this is actually a type of game now. It's a new type of game that I actually like. I like the idea, I like the fact that I can actually engage in a." relatively believable military setting in a fight against uh, terrorists or uh, the United Nations sponsored uh, military in Europe and in Africa. It has all the locations correct. It has all the cutscenes that give it a relatively realistic feeling for the time, I believe. Uh, it's pretty innovative in many ways. In fact, it, I believe it was also one of the first games to offer an MP3 soundtrack, or at least uh, basically a CD soundtrack for a PC game. Which was not actually that common back then. Most games back then used the uh, MIDI music, uh, which is uh, definitely not the case for this title. Right. Yeah. They so there's a lot of innovations going on, and it's, yeah, I believe it's why many people, including probably the developers themselves, didn't really bother to look at the level designs too much and all the other flaws. So I think that that definitely has to be taken into consideration when making this review. So even though it's actually a fairly infuriating game to play. We <laughs> yeah. all owe a lot to it, basically, for what it did, for its role in history, and for inspiring better games to come in the future. Yeah, so the historical account definitely needs to be taken into account when you're reviewing the game, when you're passing judgment on it. Uh, sort of the same way that I try to handle modern playthroughs and reviews for brood war campaigns that are from like 1998 like the bob levels where there's some things that transcend the age of the production like the humor and other things that do not like the level design and so you can sort of take a crack at reviewing and providing uh, just sort of any old critique and analysis of whatever you may be working with so in this particular case i definitely do agree that command and conquer it's history or it, rather it the history that led back to it, if you go backwards in time, that's more important to me than the game itself. As a game, it's not really that interesting. Uh, but I had a exchange with Mesk over Discord, uh, I think later on the very same day we concluded the project entirely, where he was mentioning that uh, there were a bunch of high-quality mods released for Brood War. And one of the ones that he had referenced, we had recently played on Mod Night, and I was like, well, that's high quality. I mean, it holds no value as a an experience. And he said, yes, but the only value from mods were tech demos. They, they were just ways that you could learn how to do new things with the engine, basically. They weren't really useful as playing by themselves because they would never be a successor to StarCraft itself, and nobody was really even trying to do that. They were really just trying to make something that was flashy and interesting and technically sound. And, uh, Maybe even just fun to make and right, yeah. interesting to play rather than breaking new ground sometimes. Yeah. And so I think as a result of that uh, that quick little exchange that Mesk and I had, I have a 
just a newfound uh, perspective on this particular title. Whereas, uh, I'm not gonna lie, man, it is pretty fucking annoying to play. It's terrible. Like, as a game, it's not good, but as an RTS, it's cool to see the ideas that eventually grew into what we now consider standards for an RTS that we then keep away from custom campaigns. So, I guess I'll just uh, close a little intro here before we get into individual discussions by acknowledging yep. the fact that the the game is important historically, and that does give it some of a pass just based on the fact that we understand it wasn't like meant to be a modern title because it wasn't a modern title, and so we can't really review it like a modern title. But there are some lessons to be learned from the game's level design especially, but also some of the mechanics that they implemented that I think we'll get into. And uh, hopefully those are useful for modern developers and fans of the RTS genre that have stuck around even to this day. Because that will help you understand why some stuff, even in the modern day, or somewhere in between the modern day and Command & Conquer 1, were good or bad or fun or not fun to play. And uh, I think we had a, a similar sort of small version of this conversation in the middle of one of the longer streams where we had concluded the GDI campaign and sort of went over our thoughts on some of the mechanics and how the levels were yeah. more so the, the main issue. Uh, so uh, would you rather to start us off talking about the levels themselves or the core uh, mechanics? Well, I was thinking maybe we should start by talking about the positive aspects if we can find any. Let's see what I can think of. All right. So I've already mentioned how the game is definitely really original for its time, not only in its gameplay style, but also in its presentation. There were not really that many games that employed a similar level of uh, military conflict theme and employed it fairly successfully, I believe. Even in terms of gameplay, you do see stuff like GDI attacking a civilian city. There is a lot of stuff that's going on that actually makes the game world feel much more alive than many other games from the same era, basically which oftentimes just uh, presented stuff only in text. And uh, besides that, when it comes to the actual gameplay, I would say uh, most of the good things are really just good ideas that simply did not have very good execution. Uh, one of the examples is the micro missions. So obviously, we have went before how micro missions in general are bad, and this is not really a problem that's ex exclusive to this title as the micro missions in this title just really, like any other mission, really benefit over uh, pure map knowledge. So if you actually know how to beat the level, then the micro missions are actually relatively uh, straightforward, most of them anyway. So when it comes to the actual gameplay in the micro missions, one thing I noticed is that the de developers were trying to encourage different types of units into being used for different types of purposes. I believe then, third or fourth node missions is a good example of this where you are given four buggies and a bunch of uh, anti-tank units and you have to basically shuffle them around in order to get maximum combat efficiency so you have to basically rotate the armies in a game that has no formation or anything even remotely is resembling that in order to be able to counter suffer several different threats that you encounter in the level now this is a good idea but the execution is terrible Aside from being a micro mission, it's terrible because of the completely random damage values that the game has, where a grenadier can destroy your bug in one or two hits. So I do appreciate how the game, even this early on, this didn't just limit itself to just having, you know, two infantry unit types in the entire game, for example. There is a, an attempt to make in different army composi compositions available gameplay options. It's just that for most of the units, the execution is just too uneven to be of any value, especially today. So many units are either too weak, too strong, or in some cases they are very strong in the hands of the player, such as the Grenadiers and the Flame Troopers, but really useless once you get them yourself, as they tend to blow up your entire armies instead. So I do appreciate this. I'm, I'm going to chalk it up as a good point that's just not very well executed. And it is something that has been improved in the sequel, which I replayed as a bit recently just, you know, to get a feel whether it will be as good or bad as this one. And I can actually say it is much improved. So that is one positive aspect I can mention. Um, maybe, do you have any any such similar positive or semi-positive semi aspects you can think of like this? 
Uh, well, like I any... appreciated the fact that the tech trees were actually disparate across the different factions. I mean, there's obviously, oh. like, the infantry were very, very similar. But yeah. when you look at the way that the uh, the vehicles and aircraft differentiated, although some of the differences, like the airstrip, the way that it worked instead of a, a war factory, was just stupid. And also doesn't really make any sense for, a, like, a terrorist faction. Like, you'd think, okay, they're not manufacturing them on site, but they sell the resources to fly them in from other places. Yeah. Still breaks immersion in that way. Five million planes every second. Yeah, yeah. So it definitely could have used some optimization in that respect. But... I, I still feel like it's shocking to me how different the factions were for a game of this age, where you look at yeah. Warcraft 2, where all the races were identical, like the only differences were the spellcasters, I believe the HP values and stuff were the same, like ogres yeah. were knights and grunts were footmen and uh, whatever, I think axe throwers or whatever. A lot of early RTS games have this problem indeed, and right. this is actually a good point you are making. Yeah, yeah. I think that it adds a lot to not just replay value of the missions, but it, since there is now a skirmish mode um, that has been added in by a fan patch, I think you said, there's an yeah. ability to sort of experiment with that. And I think it also served an important sort of a watershed moment for Westwood themselves as they realized, hey, it's way better if these factions are characterized differently in the way that they express their you know, story gameplay wise, like they're, they're expressing different story through their gameplay by having these fire based units and having the, uh, you know, the various uh, just differences between the different factions that yeah. will then go on to help them develop proper, uh, what would you say, proper factions that are even more fleshed out and in better ways i think at least i hope in the future titles at least i can yeah. remember the third command and conquer game which obviously has a lot of flaws being 3d chief among them uh, that would certainly have some issues with balance but i thought that they had significantly more differences in between the tech trees in that game compared to the first command and conquer that we just sat down yeah and so I figured that that's a linear change, sort of, where like it, it increases in complexity as time goes on. Maybe there's some bumps along that line graph. But to me, I think that it's another instance where they were innovative or uh, technically proficient with their concepts, as well as their in technical implementation of those concepts in certain respects. Now, yes, some of the concepts themselves are not very sound, but most of the time they're implemented without any issues. There's obviously some like really annoying bugs with harvesters and uh, not having enough refineries. They would just like spin and stuff. And then you'd have uh, the airplanes. If they didn't have the sufficient telepads or if they were destroyed, the new ones you would requisition wouldn't go straight to the new, the open helipad. They would like fly to the most recent one for some reason, which actually could fuck you because for whatever reason, you can't select air units while they're flying. So yeah. the, there's some bugs, obviously there's some, uh, some stuff I would call a bug, even if it was designed intentionally. And uh, hopefully those are, and from what I've been told, those are actually, in fact, resolved more or less completely once you roll into the later titles. So looking forward, actually, like it's one of the few times where I played a game and maybe it is mostly because it's an RTS and less so because of the game's quality itself. But I'm I'm excited to see where the, the development studio went with their future titles, whereas like usually I'll play a game and it'll be a disaster and I'll just not want to ever to touch anything that the developer makes or only have a passing yeah. interest. Whereas this one, we were already planning on doing the other games, obviously, but it's significantly better, I think, in terms of how motivated I am to get into that. So we'll probably be doing that sooner rather than later. Yeah. Well, so. that's actually a good point. And some more innovations, I believe, were the fact that some of the missions uh, had different paths you could take. Some of them only influenced the way the, the way you start on the map, as otherwise it was very similar. For example, the last mission for both factions were exactly like that. But uh, other times, instead, the map would be completely different. Sometimes it would be a micro mission, sometimes it would be a mission where you had a base. So that's another innovation that does add some replay value. Although it is unfortunate that the game does not show you anything in advance before you click on the provinces. So you are pretty much going in blind. And, uh, Unless you have a trusty dynamo to check them out yeah. on Instagram or whatever the fuck, whatever website you were using. And uh, this, actually, this actually is a good opportunity to delve into the game's flaws. The first of which is the level design. Yeah. So the level design in this game, when looking at the actual maps on uh, the map side as well as in-game, obviously, 
uh, many of the flaws seem really, really obvious. I remember one of the GDI missions. I don't remember which one it was exactly. I could probably try to look it up as I, I'm talking, but the main issue with that mission was that there were a bunch of uh, turrets in a canyon, and uh, there was basically a resource patch that was located on the very opposite side of your base, meaning that in order to reach the res those resources, you had to go all the way through the canyon in order to reach them, in a game where it is not really possible to expand easily or to even uh, get decent pathfinding on your adversary who, who al will always uh, hump the mountainside, basically, yeah. significantly wasting a lot of time, which I don't think is a, a, a thing that really few people have noticed. I mean, even if you are making the, the game and you just play the mission once, you're bound to see this behavior at least once, which you could argue that you don't want to spend the programming effort required to fix the pathfinding, but you could at least build the fucking level in a way that doesn't require you to basically experience the worst possible pathfinding that you can, you can, you can have, basically. Yeah, so and that's definitely a legitimate... That's really the, the main issue here, is that the, pet, the level design actually significantly makes the game's issues much worse than they will be if the levels were made in a more sensible way. And uh, that's not even just related to the aforementioned issue of advanced map knowledge, you know, prior map knowledge, where if you know how to beat the level, and it's something, this is something we have actually seen ourselves, like when you accidentally reloaded the save during the last stream and you end up playing a previous mission, yeah. which you completed very, very quickly, as opposed to the first time you played it. And so you already knew what to do, you knew what, what the enemy base was, and so this uh, prior knowledge essentially makes most of the challenge completely obsolete. And uh, yeah, th that's one issue, but the other wish issue, like I said, is just the fact that a game was built in such a way where so many of the game's problems were really, really heavily uh, made worse by how the levels were built. Like another example I want to give is in the last node mission, where uh, we found out uh, very easily this. This is another thing that is not exactly easy to miss. Uh, uh, hard to miss, sorry. Basically, the airstrike ability is going to target the northernmost unit or building that you have. Now, that final mission was built in a way that you are very likely to place your MCV on the very top of the map. They could have started you on any other location, and the airstrikes would actually most likely have targeted down your units, which would have made a lot more sense in terms of story, as well as in terms of gameplay itself. So instead, what you had was a situation where the enemy constantly bombarded your MCV and you had to spend thousands and thousands of money into repairing it. And uh, this is another case where you might argue that it's such an early game, so they, they didn't want to bother in, in uh, improving the AI or whatever. They just wanted to get the game out the door, which is fine. Basically, most game companies do that anyway. I think the vast majority yeah. of games are rushed. I mean, StarCraft itself... Uh, as well as many, many other titles, have a lot of uh, have a lot of unfinished features and stuff like that. But the problem is that why would you build a level in a way that accentuates the the problem with the feature that you have that is all finished? That's really the issue here. So many of the levels offer examples like this. I believe these two really bring the point home. Basically, really showcase how the much of the suffering we had was actually tied to how the game's primitive mechanics were really made infuriating by the level design itself. And that's pretty much the main issue with this game, I believe. I don't know if you agree with this perspective. Uh, I think that there's certainly merit to it. Like, my issue with the game comes down to the fact that, like you're saying, the level design is really, really bad. And the game's mechanics would be more tolerable, like you're saying, if the level design was improved. Uh, this is actually one of those areas where I actually think there's a lot that custom content developers can glean from this sort of production because most often we're not in a, the business of redoing a whole lot of system-wide work because the game we're modding has some potential based on its own systems and that we see and we want to accentuate with our work. And so most of the time we're not like redoing a bunch of stuff and you know I guess some of the Hydra stuff that I've 
but uh, been working on is a little bit different in that respect. But for the most part, you're not really, you know, making a reinventing the wheel, so to speak. You're not changing everything about the game. And so in this context, if you consider what if the Command and Conquer campaigns were made not by professionals, but by modders, like you'd have the same sort of criticism is that the they didn't take into account the core mechanics of the game they didn't take into account how the game performs and how the pathfinding is and what some of the ai quirks are and they didn't obviously they, we're not in this context necessarily expecting them to fix these quirks and oddities and flaws with the pathfinding like the core gameplay mechanics of the game we're taking those as if they were final and non-negotiable which of course they aren't really but just for the sake of argument uh, just consider that those are always going to be there, then of course you want to modify your level design in ways that maybe don't make sense if those mechanics aren't there, but are required in order for the missions to be playable, basically, if those uh, yeah. mechanics are there and the, they are implemented in that exact way. And so I would, uh, yeah, I would definitely say that there's a lot to that. And hopefully that connection that I made is going to be helpful for developers down the line who don't want to redo a bunch of systems and don't want to go in and fix a bunch of AI issues, but just want to use some, some stuff that's out of the box with whatever new stuff they're adding in and decide, okay, well, with this perspective, I understand then the level design needs to be compatible with whatever the core gameplay actually is. And uh, yeah, I think that that's like a main issue with the game that I was surprised to see because I wasn't actually expecting the game to have an issue like that where you would expect some oddities and some flaws and some bugs because it's an RTS and it's like really the first major like modern title or modern resembling title out there. Uh, a lot of people will say like Dune 2 or whatever is is representative of it, but really it's like you're selecting one unit at a time and stuff. It's, it's UI is very primitive, like way more worse than this in that respect. Yeah. And so there's think, even earlier games than Dune 2. So right, yeah, yeah. So like at that point, where do you where do you draw the line? I think Command and Conquer is a fine line to draw, or if you want the yeah. original Warcraft, it's just uh, like they're in the same they're occupying the same space in time, and I think that that's a fine line to draw. But you also have to realize that what you're uh, what you're saying about this when you say it's like one of the first RTSs or the first proper RTS, uh, of course you're going to expect some issues with it in terms of its underlying mechanics, but you wouldn't expect things that you can fix just by testing and seeing that there's an issue. It's like it, the only people who tested the maps themselves were the level designers who knew what to look for, in which case they said, wow, this is an easy game. All right, done. And, you know, sure, it's it's easy if you're if you know what you're doing, and as I demonstrated myself as a garbage player who was still able to yeah. easily clear missions that I didn't, uh, uh, that I had already played, right? So I knew everything about. Or is it that yeah, same? For player? example, before we started the first stream or the second stream, the first one I was involved with basically. Yeah. You actually speed run like the first four GDI missions, I believe, which yeah. took you almost no time or, or effort at all. Yeah, it was like 15 minutes. So. That's a showcase of how important prior knowledge is when playing this. And uh, as I've mentioned uh, uh, before in the videos themselves, this is a game that is easily suited for speedrunners. So maybe I, I don't, I'm not really one who does that, but I can understand why some people who are into that side of thing can actually enjoy the game so much as it is a game that's really easily uh, suited for this uh, purpose. Yeah. But uh, that's definitely not the angle we're approaching it from. It, as uh, it shouldn't really be... Basically, requiring prior map knowledge is actually not a good thing. That is uh, what we are saying here. Yeah, so I, I, I look at know. it this way. It's like, it's okay if a speedrunner could find a way to cheese your map and yeah. you know do something that requires skill and maybe a, a lot of prior map knowledge in order to pull off a strategy like this. Like, they discover a strategy to complete a level in your game way faster than maybe you could have ever conceived of. Now, if it's due to a bug or something, then maybe that's something you want to look into. And if it's something that just makes an absolute mockery of what your level is, maybe, again, you might want to look into that. But most of the time, people just take that and they say, yeah, that's fine, you know. Um, as long as the majority of players are still required to express their skills and they're not either able or willing to grind out the number of hours required to find a specific speedrun strat like you're so speedrunning is basically you're taking these steps of a game that is supposed to be uh, especially in terms of an rts something that evolves over time and you get these emergent gameplay loops where stuff happens as a result of stuff happening 
you know, minutes or seconds or hours ago in the level. And you're, you're just now seeing that manifestation. It's something that the developer could never have necessarily predicted or intentionally predicted in some respects, but it wasn't explicitly written in that this would happen. Sort of like AIs taking a bunch of expansions and varying orders based on their own randomizer or something like that. And uh, so that's a, a very easy example that most people can understand. So you're taking uh, something that's emergent and you're saying, let's remove all emergent elements out of it. Let's just get it down to a script that I can follow as a player if I'm good enough at mechanically, basically, because I already have the strategy written out for me. And so when you're doing that, like that's, I'm not saying that that's not a valid way to enjoy a game. I'm just saying that that's not the way that most people enjoy their games and nor should it be the target of uh, most developers. As, you know, if you're yourself a developer and you're a speedrunner, like you like both of those things, then sure, design your game however you want. But uh, most people are going to enjoy your title if it's got emergent gameplay. And at least that's the perspective I come at it from. I think that a game that rewards as, and manifests as many skill, uh, or, or not skill sets, but like player uh, play styles, that's the term. And uh, as long as you're manifesting a game world that allows you as a player to manifest your own play style with whatever concessions you need to make as a result of having a maybe unorthodox play style or whatever benefits you're getting for playing a more meta play style, you should, you know, take pride in that achievement, I think, because you're allowing a bunch of different players to come in from whatever perspective they have on an RTS or what FPS or whatever game you're making and say, I've got a strategy in mind, I'm going to try to execute it and they can find success if they're good enough. If there's certain things like, you know, you remove all guns of uh, like all sniper guns from a certain level because you don't want players who are good at sniping to succeed. That's like an example of what this game did a lot where it would, you know, remove, uh, you know, pre-place a bunch of stuff to prevent rushers uh, actually preventing some sort of speedrun strategies. It, you know, you have to do the right speedrun strat in order to be successful for it, as opposed to being able to take what the core gameplay of speedrunning actually is in some respects, or rushing in this case actually is, and say, uh, hey, instead of following the script, I'm just going to, you know, these are my goals and I'm going to try to succeed in, in achieving all of those goals. I've got like a task list and I'm going to try to check off all of these tasks in uh, some order, like expand here and build this and attack here. And, you know, you can't really do that in a lot of the Command and Conquer games because you're funneled down one path of decision making. Yeah, that's uh, that's a pretty good summary of what the issues with the levels are. I mean, we were not trying to speedrun, so we could probably have really cheesed a lot of the maps. Like, you know, using a buggy to bait a defense force and then stepping into their base with, without an issue, for example. That is definitely something yeah. that has been done in other videos I've seen. There's also some insane glitches involving walls, apparently, which the I cannot deal with. But, uh, uh, yeah, I think this is a really good analysis of the flaws of the level design of the game. The other main issue that the game has, in my view, is the units themselves are now utterly unbalanced and really random they are. Every unit is extremely inaccurate, from the rifle soldiers to the artillery to the grenadiers to maybe even the flame tanks, uh, even the boats, even the orcas, the flying units, everything in this game is inaccurate. And uh, everything revolves around splash damage. But the problem is that even if you want to make a game like this, even if this is the style of gameplay you want to follow, even if this is what uh, you would rather have, this is what you want to experiment with, basically. The problem is that the damage values are so random that it's just not fair. It's just not readable. When you are playing a map, you have a buggy, and you are attacked with a grenadier. One time it just takes a little bit of health away from it, and the other time it almost destroys it in one single hit. A unit that costs far more than a grenadier requires a 2,000 building to construct instead of a ship barracks, and uh, Everything basically follows the rule of the dice in that case. There is no strategy that can be consistently applied if the unit damage values are so random. So sometimes your units like the flame troopers and the grenadiers will blow up your entire army, but other, ta other times they will not. Sometimes the artillery units will destroy your entire infantry forces, while other times it will fire over the mountain cliff or whatever. Sometimes they will not even hit buildings at all. And the artillery units in particular are not even outranging the base defenses. So there's so much uh, random values going on that I, I'm not sure why they wanted to experiment in this way. I've recently played Red Alert 1, like I said, and uh, 
damage values seem to be significantly less random, including the accuracy. So maybe this was just an experiment they did and it didn't work out, so they scrapped it later. Or maybe they were trying to do some sort of different gameplay style, which didn't end up working out and they simply left some of that stuff in the main game. It's hard to say exactly why they did this, but basically all, all these random damage values are really the main issue with the combat and why it's so infuriating to play the micro missions, as there is absolutely no consistency to be found. Everything is just random damage or really random accuracy. Yes. And I think that's really the main issue with the core gameplay. Well, it contributes Besides... to the randomized level design as well. Or not the randomized level design. The, um, the fact that the level design feels so... Uh, like... It's a foregone conclusion based on your prior knowledge whether or not you'll have success. Uh, because yeah. even though, like, th those two things sound opposite. And they so it sounds like if you have random shit that's determining battles, then, um, you know, why would you say that there's always a guarantee of success if you go for a speedrun strat? And uh, technically there isn't, I guess, uh, always a guarantee. It's just that the, the randomization really only affects the people who aren't, doing those speedrun strats for the most part like it does impact all battles obviously but the rng nature of combat does make it so that if you are not aware of how roughly how the combat is determined and aware of how the map is laid out you're gonna have a really infuriating time sometimes and an surprisingly pleasant one other times or at least not infuriating because of combat being random and so it just ends up contributing to itself. Like the, re the main issue, I think, with one of the main issues with le the level design being the way it is, is that actually destroys replayability because who wants to replay the mission for the millionth time when you've, you know the solution as soon as you start and it doesn't test your knowledge of Command & Conquer. It tests your knowledge of that mission. It doesn't test your skill at playing Command & Conquer. It tests your skill at playing that mission more so than anything else. And that is way less interesting than, you know, having a bunch of levels act as a test for a player in terms of like uh, they're always taking the same test mechanically but it's a different test strategically and that that's where it can be more interesting uh with the random damage element like it felt random i'm not actually convinced it necessarily is random like i don't know the math behind it it feels like like the way that you were I think explaining it's all uh, due to the collision collision detection basically right yeah so if it like a hand lands a couple pixels away from the center of the unit or something yeah. it does a different damage than if it lands exactly on the center of the unit and there might be some random elements as to where like where targeting the unit grenades go like do grenades have a, a random offset to pick from six pixels around the target or something like that. Maybe that has some element to it. There's definitely an element of random damage, at least it seems like it, with the survivors of, you know, uh, vehicles and units, where, or uh, vehicles and buildings, rather, and destroy vehicles and destroying buildings sometimes, or at least often, re results in uh, riflemen coming out, or a couple of infantry coming out, if it's a building. Uh, sometimes a, a Todd Nishin, as we found out. And I feel like it's, you know... Yeah. <laughs> okay. There's some issues with the way that it's all random and, and kept secret from the player. Like, the formula is never really explained. It's probably very complicated for a player to understand while they're also trying to juggle the understanding of everything else in the game. It's maybe a little bit too much to expect out of your players to try and remember your bullshit RNG formulas. But, so that, that what I'm saying is that telling the player this information isn't necessarily the solution. But at the very least, it doesn't feel like there's just some stuff that's unknowable that you, you know, ha have to... Th that can determine the fate of your battles more so than your own skill. Like, I want every failure, which there will be many of any RTS game I play or of any game I play because I am garbage. I want every failure that I have to be legitimately my fault insofar as I don't feel like it was partially my fault. It was partially just a bullshit part of the game that destroyed me more so than my own skill. Like, it's a difficult thing and sometimes even a subjective thing to look at, at least with mo the way that most people argue stuff. And everybody's familiar with the whole uh, uh, cop out of saying, hey, I've got my, you know, I, I lost in this team game. Must have been my teammate's fault or I lost in this uh, 1v1 game like uh, Brood War. Must have been balanced more so than my own. Um, and in some ways I can sympathize with what they're saying. But for the most part, it's like, you know, you're, you have a framework of rules and as long as the game doesn't just randomly change them every week like StarCraft II or League of Legends, then I, I don't think you can be reasonably expected to blame the developer when you're yourself not adapting to the consistent rule sets that you've seen. 
And it's just the issue with RNG is that it's never actually consistent, uh, at least not within the window that we want consistency to actually be. Like I've seen top uh, Warcraft 3 gamers, gamers from Bob Levels, be playing uh, Orc, and they're just praying for crits on their Blade Master, and that determines fights. It's like, you yeah. literally cannot account for luck when dealing with skill and when assessing skill. And that's why RNG is so antithetical to any actual game development when you're trying to be competitive. And the th thing about single-player stuff like Command & Conquer 1 is if I'm taking the game seriously and I'm not just, you know, laughing at it for being a laughing stock, which in many cases I ended up doing in this playthrough, if I were to take it seriously, I'd have to contend with so much random shit that's completely out of my control that I do not feel respected as a player and I do, do not feel like my time is being, you know, uh, respected as either. And sort of like an issue with the fact that the game is so old, you would think, except we still have modern productions that do this or worse. And so that's sort of like the main sticking point that's stuck in my craw is like, you know, this would be fine if it was a relic of a bygone era, but most of the people still haven't learned this this problem. Yeah, learned from this it's game. It's incredible that some productions actually haven't learned from mistakes that develop the developers of this game actually learned from in future titles. Yeah, that's so. really, really impressive to think about. Yeah, I mean, and, you're uh, always going to have people who grew up and never played these games, so they never got a chance to learn. But you'd think, you'd hope, anyways, that the games that they did play did learn from these uh, lessons. Like, Blizzard was around when Command & Conquer was in its heyday, and they obviously made Brood War, which I believe is the greatest RTS, potentially the greatest game of all time, and at least in terms of its multiplayer. And so you, you, they made that, and then they didn't learn from it, really, because then they went on to make World, uh, Warcraft 3 and, and World of Warcraft. So. Yeah, that's pretty much the case. And uh, when it comes to the lessons that this game has, well, when it comes to the actual features, I would say we briefly touched upon this earlier and it, it is actually surprising how sophisticated in some ways this game was. I was expecting a much more barebone experience than uh, what I actually end up, ended up getting. Yeah. So maybe a lot of the issues are really rushed features. Like the game tried to do too much at once instead of just focusing on really polishing the core gameplay. Yeah, you I just can agree with that many different ideas to many different things at once, which, I mean, in a genre that had no standards before, this kind of makes sense, as you are just basically throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks. But uh, at least we can say that some of the lessons have been learned by these developers as well as other developers, like Blizzard at least temporarily, and, uh, you know, the Age of Empires developers and many others. But uh, definitely... The game, I think, overextended itself. That's uh, that's an issue I think the game has. It tried to do too many things. It tried to reinvent the wheel, too many maps. Like, it gives you the MCV, but in some maps you actually have to find it with a commando for no reason whatsoever. Um, many just really random gameplay features that didn't make sense and were not consistent. So maybe they were just experimenting with them, seeing which ones worked best and which ones did not work out at all and just decided to leave them all together in the final package. That is a possible interpretation of why some of the game's levels are like they are, are basically this way, but it may be a long shot. Well, and I think I'm just possible. glad that, uh, that this has been an available lesson even today in terms of what has to be avoided when making a map, basically. Yeah, I can agree with that. I think it's um, it was surprisingly effective at sort of explaining to me why I uh, why I have so many issues with a lot of the modern day custom content and a lot of the modern day RTSs if you can call them modern since nobody really makes them anymore as it was interesting to see how these developers ended up contending with their flaws uh, potentially contending with them in the future titles but at the very least ex you know they exhibited these issues in their their end product and maybe you're right. Maybe you're onto something when you say that the developers may have been in a position where they were just, you know, having a bunch of ideas and they didn't know what which ones would work, and so they threw them at the wall and then they went out and refined them in later titles. I mean, that is a part of growing as a creator, anyways, is refining yeah. your old ideas, figuring out which ones have value beyond the execution that you had in the first time around, first couple of times around, and then moving away from that and saying, 
all right, let's let's cut what doesn't have value and let's refine what may have value. And it's like an endless cycle of rediscovery of making sure that you've vetted all of the ideas that you're exhibiting in your project and making sure that the mechanics are sound. And this game didn't um, have very many sound mechanics, I don't think, or at least it had very many mechanics that were not sound. And we'll, I guess we'll see whether or not those were mechanics in need of refining or mechanics that should have been scrapped when we go into future titles and see what is and is not there and see whether or not the stuff that is there should have been there and whether or not stuff that isn't there should have been included as opposed to being cut. Uh, that'll be some determinations we can make in future titles. But again, it, it speaks to the idea that you know these developers may have been growing as we've uh, alleged and they may have been deciding while well, we're making an RTS, there's not too much competition for it. Uh, let's see what we can come up with. And then they may very well have gone on to refine those concepts later on. It seems that's the case from what people are telling me. So we'll make that determination later on. But the fact that people, you know, these developers... Well, even even for all their RTS titles, though, uh, I mean, a lot of these ideas were seen by other developers, including Blizzard, and oh, many yeah, yeah, others as sure. well. And so they serve as a lesson, not just for these developers, but for everyone. Yeah. So I think that's a really fundamental aspect uh, behind this game. Uh, yeah, behind many of the other early RTS games. Yeah, for sure. Well, the thing, I, I, I'm just going to close on the idea that it's still a little shocking to me that we have developers who are not learning learning any lessons from their past failures or even their past successes. Um, you know, certainly there's some bright spots in custom content and in modern productions that could be worked on, although sometimes there are very few of them in productions like StarCraft 2, for example, but you can still learn from their inclusion. Like, for example, this game, one of its prime failures was the uh, AoE, like, splash damage on everything. And I actually feel like removing hitscan as an element is potentially viable as a strategy, but there needs to be more precise movement control available, and so th this is not the environment to test that theory in. Unfortunately, I don't think that anybody really has bothered to test that theory since, uh, so you know, maybe we'll have to do, rely on custom content to do something similar to that, uh, but that is another thing that we will discuss later on once, if and when we you know, cross that bridge, basically. So, uh, Did you have any final thoughts for Command & Conquer 1? Uh, well, basically, what, what you're saying is, in, is indeed correct, and... Uh... Some developers are, have not yet learned their lessons. Maybe one final idea I can put forward, which is not necessarily tied to this game, is that maybe sometimes there is not enough criticism, basically. Uh, there's too many yes-men, too many people who don't really understand gameplay very well or level design very well, who just think, oh, this is cool, I can just cheat through the maps, and it has these badass fights going on, which is definitely the issue with Arcane, for example. So when it comes to a game of this age, obviously, like I mentioned at the start of the review, the reviews uh, at the time were really extremely positive, but I don't think many of them uh, focus on the level design. They just focus on the innov innovative ways the game the game presented, the, the game introduced, the innovative concepts, the, the theme, the, the feeling, the, the various presentation uh, uh, benefits, like having the game on a CD with a new style soundtrack or whatever. The, the, the various ways the game innovated in, basically. So I can see why back then this would have been the first thing to look at instead of level design or gameplay. But nowadays it seems like people should be a little more critical, basically. I feel like people should look at flaws more, and instead what I often see is modern productions where the author may be the only one playing these levels, and if you make the levels, you already know how to beat them. And that is probably why the level designers for this game felt the levels were not uh, hard, as they already knew how to beat them anyway. So maybe there's just not enough criticism for both uh, commercial RTS games and modding productions. That's uh, maybe That may explain why some developers have never learned their lessons. They were never told to learn it. They were just never really presented with an environment that actually encouraged them to improve. They simply played their own maps and were surrounded by yes-men who just never really wanted to bother with gameplay or level design. It's a theory, but it's certainly one that has proven true for Arcane. So it yeah. may be actually a reality. Well, with Arcane, it's, it doesn't really hold a candle to the insanity of SC2 Mapster, which I know you're not as familiar with, but uh, there's some very similar stories that are taken up a notch over there to uh, insane results that uh, hopefully we may never experience. But nonetheless, uh, I do think that there is something to be learned for any developer. And, and that's one of the things that I'm 
grateful for with this particular production is it got me uh, gave me a chance to once again uh, go back to making content that I feel serves its purpose educationally, especially with this review where it's a little bit less uh, stressful than watching the really psychotic levels themselves. You can take a step back and take a deep breath and talk your way out of the hole that you've dug by screaming and swearing and demonetizing. And you can talk about you know the the flaws and how modern developers might you know improve in a similar way to that Westwood themselves potentially have, or at the very least could, even if they didn't say in a magical world where they made worse or the same titles afterwards, they still could have. They still set themselves up for success in the future by what they ended up doing with this title. So we can still learn from what that may have looked like or what that ended up did look, uh, you know, what that did end up looking like. Um, with regards to the other productions, you know, this is something where recently I was asked to test another uh, custom content uh, or a custom project. And, you know, one of the things that I did where I didn't really do this in the past was I actually reached out to the author and I said, hey, can you tell me what your intention is behind the production? Um, you know, what is your intention behind the mission? And I asked him, you know, a couple other like questions that were very related uh, to make sure that he understood basically what I was talking about, because it's a, probably something that nobody asks people. So yeah, maybe, yeah, there's, exactly. maybe there's like some issues with uh, understanding exactly what I mean. Uh, but uh, you know, that that will help me give better analysis anyways. Like, if, if a developer is just looking to improve the map that he sends me or the campaign that he sends me, more so than looking to learn lessons for the long haul so that when he makes his next project, he's better equipped to, for the challenges ahead and better equipped to make something that is even better than what he made before. That that's, the, the latter one is my ideal. The latter one is what I try to do uh, and the reality I try to make. Uh, but if that's not what developers want, then my feedback in that vein would not be useful to them. And th that's sort of uh, th that latter option where developers are going to improve their process so that they can make better products is actually what most of this production was all about, educationally speaking. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, it was probably the most positive review I've produced in quite a while. Uh, is is no doubt because of the fact that it's more of a historical artifact than a uh, more of a tech demo, as we referenced earlier, than potentially an enjoyable game by itself. Uh, but certainly I could see where people could go from here to make something enjoyable. And I hope that other developers have also seen the light in that respect. Made it, maybe I was able to help them understand it a little bit better. And uh, of course, there's always the uh, conversation continuing over on Discord or in the comments section. So uh, yeah, I think I'll leave it at that unless you have yeah. anything else to say. Yeah, it seems pretty much... Uh, we covered, I think, most of the aspects that, that this game presented. And uh, we could, of course, talk more about, you know, the sound design, the graphics, stuff like that. But I think we already talked about those during the actual playthrough. And yeah. I think, as an educational value, this review really touched upon the main points that we needed to discuss. So yeah. I think we're pretty good on that. Yeah, I agree. Nothing else to add on my end? Oh. I just uh, basically... I actually found this an interesting production, and I am glad to have experienced it, even if it was not by playing it directly this time. I did play it a bit years ago, and it, had, it definitely has been interesting. So that's that much I can say. I do look forward to the other ones, and uh, I do hope that some of the issues we talk about are actually fixed in other games, not just other CNC games, but other games in general, to show that... Uh, advice and uh, critique can actually be a positive aspect to improve production. So that's Sounds pretty good. much it for me. Well, thank you for joining me, and thank you, viewer, for watching, and we will be back with more Command & Conquer sometime soon. Bye. See ya.